Hey guys, Jack Spierko hanging out in the aviary today with the quails. There's one of them crawling under there right now. Um, and uh, things are looking really good. And we're going to try something new starting today. Straw Bale Gardens. Joel, Carl, Car, Joel Karsten uh, was on my podcast last week and uh, talked about this method of gardening called Straw Bale Gardening. And uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the straw bales and what we're going to try with them. I just went and picked up six bales at my uh, local feed store, and I'll tell you what, for what they're charging for them, I'm going to have to find a new source of straw bales if this works out. I wanted to see exactly how well this worked. Uh, Joel made a very good case for it on my podcast, and I thought that maybe you guys would want to uh, actually see whether or not it worked and uh, how it worked. I'm sure it will work. The question is, how well will it work, I guess? Uh, but here's what we're doing right now. I am, I've already done all the other bales. Just this last bale here needs to be watered in. I've already hit them with the, uh, they call it bale buster, which is basically pork blood meal and uh, bac uh, bacillus bacterium and uh, a fungi. I can't remember exactly the tr trichogama fungi, which is a really great fungi for fungal inoculation. And I need to put a gallon per bale uh, of water on them today with their inoculant. You can see a little bit of the inoculant right there. And basically it starts a slow composting process. You might wonder, well, how the hell that fool Mel Wally was talking that he used a gallon of water? Well, took a one quart little mini bucket, a little red one over there, counted how long it took it to fill it up in six seconds. And uh, so six seconds for a quart, 24 seconds for a gallon of water. And uh, I just watched the timeline on the video run 24 seconds off while I was doing that. So y'all didn't have to sit me here listening to me going one, two, three, because you'd be bored as hell. So anyway, we did that. But here's what comes next. Uh, we have to do this inoculation process. So on days one, three, and five, we're going to add two cups of the inoculant, which I'll show you in just a second. On days two and four, we will not add any inoculant, but we will add one gallon of water per bale. On day six, we'll just add a gallon of water. On day seven, we'll add one cup instead of two cups per bale. And then eight, um, we'll add a cup. Day nine, we'll add a cup. Day 10, we'll add a cup of wood ashes and a cup of bone meal. I don't know if I have clean wood ashes. I got a lot of charcoal, but I don't know if I have wood ashes, so I might have to skip the wood ashes. But the bone meal, that'll be no problem. I keep bone meal around for other reasons. Uh, days 11 through 17, we will not add any more inoculant or fertilizer of any kind, but we will hit the bales with a gallon of water a day. And uh, on day 18, we can plant, which will be right up about the time I'm heading to Florida for my vacation. But I got a caretaker, and I'm pretty sure he can, he can hit them with a gallon of water a day. I'm not sure exactly what we're going to plant. One thing that Joel made a really great case for is tomatoes. Now, as you guys can see, I can grow the hell out of some tomatoes um, in my wicking beds. But my experience has been that they'll do really, really good. And just about the time they start really producing for me, they'll start getting blight. And when we go through that period of time where most tomato growers just have their tomatoes not produced, the blight will just eat up my tomatoes and I will not get a second uh, harvest like most people do. In fact, I would say if you look right there, you can. Pro that's probably a little bit of blight starting right there. Probably a little bit of blight right there. Um, usually the worst blight starts in the bottom and works up, like that right there. So we'll get a nice harvest, and I've got tomatoes in every one of these beds. But Joel says if you do what he says and you grow your tomatoes in these straw bales, you get no blight. We'll give that a try, and we'll see how it works out. The problem is blight is a soil-borne fungus, and once it's in your soil, if you live down here in the south where it's great growing conditions, you can see how everything blows up. The problem is cold weather doesn't kill off the fungus, and uh, so it comes back every year. So we'll see. Anyway, these are all done. Uh, another step in the process, you're supposed to make a bunch of holes in the bale, and from the reading the instructions, it sounds like probably a good idea to make new holes each time you add more inoculant. I just use this long flat tip screwdriver and just push it down into the bales and just kind of wallered them out a little bit and made a bunch of holes like that. 
What are we going to plant here? Like I said, tomatoes. I'll probably do some runner beans. And uh, we'll just see how things go with this. Again, I, I'm not advocating this yet. Though the man's been doing it 30 years. And I, this is what I got to say about that. If something is not worth doing, it is seldom that a man will dedicate 30 years of his life to doing it, teaching people about it, uh, evangelizing it, etc. He'll probably give up on it and go do something else. So I expect this to work again. We'll see how well. We're also going to see... If Mr. Quail and Mrs. Quail, there's more Mrs. than Misters in here, and that is Mrs. Quail right there. If they're going to jump up on here and cause problems, um, they have not bothered the wicking beds I've put on the ground at all yet this year. And these are, you know, but these are like a foot lower, pretty small bales. And uh, we'll see if, uh, what they think about it. It's, the bales been in here a few hours. They don't seem to have any interest in them, which kind of surprises me. If there were chickens in here, they'd be all over this. And then the other thing is, there's a lot of stuff they eat, but there's a lot of stuff they don't eat. If I, if I take even a piece of this amaranth like this and uh, offer it to Mrs. Quail there, she just do doesn't really have much interest in it. Now, there are things like, if I threw some lettuce down there or something, she'll start pecking at that. So, you know, maybe if I'm going to do any of these in here long term, uh, you know certain crops just don't get done in them. They get done in the wicking beds or whatever But I'm not worried about them eating peppers tomatoes, etc. They just don't have much interest again. They're not chickens they're quails uh, They like seeds and they like their feed on their feed. I, I got something here I got tired of using these chick feeders decided to go back to an old-school poultry feeder Found this cleaning out the outbuilding and I got it up under here and uh, the problem is when we get rain, we're gonna, supposed to have rain tomorrow. Rain often comes in at an angle and soaks these things down. So I just took this galvanized dealy whopper. That keeps the rain off my food. So as soon as they clean out those chick feeders, and that one's probably all dust now, I'll get them out of here. We're going to nothing but that. And they got their watering buckets. We'll see how this works out. I want to update you on some other things too. I made a decision this year to get all these wicking beds and take them to the ground. They're cut off of the aquaponic system now. They're not flow through wicking beds anymore. They're static wicking beds, easy enough. And when I get them on the ground for next growing season in the back, I'm gonna have this big nine foot wall to train them up. But right now you can see my problem. I've already got tomatoes breaking through the top of the aviary. You got beans breaking through the top of the aviary. Uh, it won't be long cucumbers are gonna there's cucumber back there. We'll be breaking out of the top of the aviary So when we drop this and we're only two foot off the ground, I've got six seven foot of Vertical space before we're breaking the top of the aviary. So that may be useful Up front here now that I've got them on the ground. That's fine But as you can see the, the top here. I cannot reach that. It's a nine foot back wall I cannot reach nine foot in the air I can barely jump and touch it, so I'm limited. But what I've been working on today is I'm running this fencing wire, this is electric fencing wire, and uh, training these uh, runner beans up onto it. Those are my uh, Ichiban, uh, what do you call them, eggplants here. Got a couple of those. I don't want to plant too much eggplant because Dorothy and I can only eat so much of it. And eggplant just don't store, I don't know any way to store eggplant. So uh, we're going to try to grow a little bit for some uh, some grilling and some uh, baba ganoush and stuff this year. More pepper plants, etc. And this is the thing about the straw bales. Like I said, I'm sure it'll work. But if you guys want to see how my wicking beds work, I mean, they're going to have to work real good for me to dedicate space to them. I mean, somebody asked on Facebook, was this a holdover pepper? I have a way I hold peppers over through the, the winter as a perennial and bring them back. No, this, this plant was planted from seed uh, uh, around February 20th, and here it is uh, May 27th. And I've been picking peppers off it for about two weeks now. Uh, we made grilled, grilled peppers. I, put, I pulled peppers off that plant last night. Uh, that's my dill. And one thing I really love about the wicking beds is how much polyculture I can get into one of these 100-gallon beds. Look at that. Oh, that makes me want to uh, stuff peppers again tonight, man. I found a, 
A formula for these guys, man, when you're making bacon wrap stuffed jalapenos, stuffed jalapenos, you cut them down the center, de-seed them, fill them with cheese, wrap them with bacon. That's always been the way. Uh, but there's always a big debate, cheddar cheese or cream cheese. And the cream cheese tends to puff up a lot, but it doesn't run out into your fire and come out of the pepper on you. The cheddar has more flavor, and the cream cheese does a better job of absorbing the bacon grease and the jalapeno flavor. Well, remember the little girl from the Taco Bell commercial with crispy or soft tacos? Why can't we have both? So last night, Dorothy and I made some of these up. That's exactly what we did. We mixed about 50% soft cream cheese with 50% uh, shredded uh, white sharp cheddar and stuffed them with that. That was fantastic and I'm really tempted to do it again. Look at these nasturtiums. Look at the size of the nasturtium leaves. We've been, I've been making food out of, out of these nasturtiums and using the leaves like lettuce wraps, a nice peppery lettuce wrap. Tomatoes are banging. As you can see, there's a lot less of the red amaranth and I really need to get in and like, these peppers all need to be tied up using this wire. There's another one of the runner beans heading for the roof. I can't wait till next season when I get all these beds on the ground. Um, I think this is white flowering gourd. It's white flowering gourd or it's a squash of some sort. And uh, it is it is making a run for the border, <laughs> you know, uh, already. Now this bed, I just just totally cleaned this out of red amaranth, and I'm about to do it again and plant some more uh, long-term plants into it. I've been eating as much of this as I can, using it as a braising green like spinach, and I can't keep up with it. The ducks can't keep up with it. The chickens can't keep up with it. So why do I grow so much of it? These are brand new wicking beds. When I establish a new wicking bed, especially early season, I plant a whole bunch of this. It puts a massive amount of roots down. I eat it as a green until I can't eat it no more. Then I start ripping it out and giving it to the chickens. And then I just throw it in the compost and let the chickens go in the compost, get whatever they want. Or the chickens get tired of eating it. But it's really a good plant to eat. It's just, again, how much can you eat? But by the time I'm done with that, we have put so much root matter down into this bed and it's gonna start breaking down. The worms are gonna eat it. It's gonna kickstart the whole evolution of this bed. That's how we did these. And that's how you look at these beds. Look at the size. <laughs> that's why I can plant so much into these beds. Uh, just kicking them off with a little bit of blood meal and whatnot every year for a little booster. And this is what we get. So this should be fun. I wanted you guys to know about the straw bales though, because and here's the thing, like you might wonder, like when you're doing this and, and, and having so much success with one thing, why do you mess with another thing? Look at the Cuban L peppers. I mean, yeah, these, these plants were also started from seed in February. Let me show you the one on the other side here. This one, I, I'm waiting. I think it's going to be, it's not these, these are nice too, but, um, I got one over here. I think it's going to be my first Cuban L to turn color for me and go red on me. I mean, come on. How big can you get as a Cuban L pepper? I mean, good Lord. I mean, guys, I have big hands. I'm, I'm a six foot tall guy, almost just like quarter inch under six foot. That is a big pepper. It just ain't getting me no color yet. Now there's a tomato that fell off. I'll eat that later. It's probably good. Grape tomatoes. Uh, these are, uh, yeah, these are sweet million actually this this variety so why if you got this going on why mess around these straw bales guys i brought this guy on my podcast he made a believer out of me that this will work will it be right for me i don't know is it the best technique for me i don't know is it the best technique period for gardening that i do know the answer is it depends what is best is dependent on the person the climate the amount of time they have to work, what their goals are, all of those things and more. You know, I keep ducks and just a couple, three little chickens that are out there to just kind of hang out and be pets. Are ducks better than chickens? I don't know, it depends. For my property, ducks are better. For your property, chickens might be better. For your life, chickens might be better. I feel like it's my responsibility when I find something like this to give it a shot and let you know how it's gonna work out. Cause I try everything, you know, you've heard about, uh, 
grow, uh, grow buckets in uh, rain gutters. Well, there's some of my overwintered peppers. I know they don't look as good as, uh, as the ones done from seed this year, but they got a, a bunch of fungus on them in the grow tent. It was my fault. I slacked off and didn't really take care of them. They got this black fungus on them. And I didn't water them for weeks going into spring. So I just cut them all the ground. I brought them back out here, threw them in here, filled the trough up with water, was going to plant something else into them. And out of, what is it, two, four, six, eight, nine buckets, five of them, four, four of them, four of them have started coming up from the roots. So we'll let them grow, we'll plant something else. I did this to see how this works. It works okay. I think it can work better if you were more dedicated to it. But it's really not for me, but I'll use it because it fits this space. And, and that's my job. My job is to figure out what works, well, how things work. And I'll let y'all know so you can figure out what works best for you. Because I'm telling you right now, there are people, I already know before trying this, that this draw bell method is going to be the way to go. This is probably not an ideal situation right here. But if I put them out here, we're going to have ducks coming up and pulling all the straw out. And chickens climbing up on them and stuff like that. There's a lot of people who don't have that issue. If you look at this, the width of everybody I've seen done these bales stacks them like this. One bale all the way down a big long line. It's almost a perfect width for double reach. You can plant a lot more this way. And, and there are people that could go out and get themselves 20 straw bales and grow all the vegetables they could use in a season and have plenty to store over. It'll work well for them. They don't have to dig. They don't have to go down as deep. They don't have to worry about weeds. There's going to be people, you know, they can afford the startup cost of something like this. That, that stock tank, if you wait, and that's what I do, and get them on sale, is about 60 bucks. Straw bale should be about five. My feed store charged me 10 bucks a bale and didn't tell me when I asked for them until I got the bill and paid it. But hey, you know, so I said I got to find a new place. But that's the thing. This is five bucks. It'll last for two seasons. It's two fifty a season. That's not that much for that much surface area. But you got to add all of that nutrient. If that works for you, that works for you. If you can get bales for two bucks a bale, some of y'all can. Some of y'all can get them for free. Well, then that works really, really great, doesn't it? That, I'll die. And that thing will still be able to grow plants. So you got to figure things out, you know, how they work out for you. That's what I'm saying. Let's go over here and check out the pond as we wrap up today. I did a pond video recently, so I won't talk too much about it. Other than to say, this is my favorite place now. And as it continues to grow in, it just becomes more and more my favorite place. The uh, water lily there is doing really nice. The Botswana feather. Uh, it's doing really, really good. Again, this is just basically a giant version of the sensitive plant. And uh, everything's starting to really shape up. Catfish and the uh, red ear sunfish, red ear bream, they're starting to feed at night. I need, probably need to feed them right about now. Uh, the uh, water lettuce and the duckweed is still kind of yellowed up. But you see that looks a lot better there. I threw that in about a week ago. I'm getting to a point now where the stuff that's kind of stunted it's coming out, and I have so much excess as we cold out, I'm dropping it in new, finding the, the ones that like it in here, I guess, is the way to go. But uh, anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed it. Charlie came out to hang out with us, didn't you, Charlie? That's my dog there, folks, if you've not met him before. Charlie Daniels, one hell of a good dog. Charlie is half pit bull and half pointer. So he's a bird dog crossed with a pit bull terrier. And you'd think a dog like that is just not a dog to be trusted with livestock. Charlie, you take good care of those ducks, don't you? Um, I've got Charlie so well trained when the ducks are up on the porch they're not supposed to be. I can say, Charlie, the ducks are on the porch, open the, the door. He'll chase the ducks off the porch, won't hurt them, won't touch them. Just knows what he's supposed to do. He's a good boy. And he's any of you people that don't like pit bulls, you don't know pit bulls. You don't know nothing about pit bulls. I think pit bulls are probably one of the greatest dogs in the world. They do require a certain level of training and discipline but they are not aggressive animals by nature they really aren't they're loving animals anyway charlie and i are going to wrap things up for the day here if you have any questions about this or any other things going on in my homestead like that giant food forest over there that guys it those of you that are new to following me you can't really understand this there's a road a big road about 150 feet that way and it used to be you could stand here and look at it. Now there's five layers of trees between here and there that look like that. 
this land wouldn't grow anything when we moved on it. It really wouldn't. We, we've transformed it. We've terraformed this piece of land. You can look at the neighbor's properties and you can see the difference. The fig growing there. More water on the property. Little water ponds. Everything's just doing really beautiful this year. So anyway, enjoyed showing you around today. If you like this, subscribe to my channel and click the bell so that you'll get emails whenever we put a new episode out. Any questions, put them down in the show notes, or I'm sorry, the video notes. And if you like what I'm doing here and you want to know more about stuff like this, check out my podcast. It's called the survivalpodcast.com. It is the longest running uh, permaculture prepper lifestyle design podcast on the internet today. Been running for 11 years. 200,000 people a day listen to it. So you just might like it too. And you can find it where? A little short URL so you don't have to type too much. TSPC.co. Not .com. TSPC.co. All the cool kids are going there. You should do and check it out and see what it's like. Subscribe to the podcast and you'll be able to get in touch with me and hear from me every day.